Praise the Lord. And welcome to yet another edition of our series of daily broadcasts. Said broadcasts which we have tagged the state of the union. That is the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. The union between Jesus and his bride, the church. And today, we will be very particular about the side of that equation called the bride. You will soon see why. But welcome again, like I said, we are still about the business of the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. We have been looking at the business of the Father. We have seen over the past two weeks or so, a couple of dimensions of expression, dimensions of relationship about the father for which he is saying tell my people to return to me he is asking us to return to him in the understanding of father father child relationship now jesus did say if you see me you see the father I and my father are one. The works that you see me do, they are the father in me doing the works. So there is a dimension in Jesus which is a revelation of the father. There is a level of oppression. There is a side to the man, Jesus, which is a revelation of the father. Now, of course, the whole of Jesus was orchestrated by the Father. Don't get me wrong. So today, I said, we will be paying attention to the expression, the Bride of Christ. The Bride of Christ. So that when he says, tell my bride, you see that now, to return. When he says, tell my people to return, let us understand that the my people actually is represented in scripture as the bride. The union between Jesus and his bride. Jesus being the representation of the Father. Praise the Lord. So let us begin by delving straight into the scriptures. Let us begin at Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14. We are looking at returning to the Father in the value of access. Access. No one comes to the Father except through me, Jesus said. Matthew chapter 14, beginning at verse number 1. And it reads, At that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus and said unto his servants this is John the Baptist he is risen from the dead and therefore mighty works do show forth themselves in him of course that's a lie mighty works were not showing forth themselves in Jesus the father 
was operating in Jesus to show forth those mighty works. Don't let an unbeliever define who you are. It is not in him. It is not in his place. Anyway, verse 3. Oh, well, let me start again. And at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard of the fame of Jesus. And he said unto his servants, This is John the Baptist. He is risen from the dead. And therefore, mighty works do show forth themselves in him. For Herod had laid hold on John and bound him and put him in prison for Herodias' sake, his brother, Philip's wife. For John said unto him, It is not lawful for thee to have her. And when he would have put him to death, he feared the multitude because they counted him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday was kept, that's verse 6, but when Herod's birthday was kept, the daughter of Herodias danced before them and pleased Herod. Whereupon he promised with an oath to give her whatsoever she would ask. And she, being before instructed of her mother, said, Give me here John Baptist's head in a charger. And the king was sorry, nevertheless, for his oath's sake, and them which sat with him at meat. He commanded it, he commanded it to be given her. Hmm. Question. The Bible says here that the young head, the young girl had been previously instructed by her mother what to ask for. How did Herodias the mother know that the opportunity would come and therefore what the daughter should ask for. How did the woman know that the opportunity and therefore what the young girl should ask for? Now, a related question would be in Esther going, you know Esther, Queen Esther, in Esther going to ask the Chamberlain what or how she should present herself. How did the Chamberlain know what the king would like to see? Now, if we understand about Chamberlains, then we won't even bother to, 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 to consider the question. If we understand about the Chamberlain, then the question already defeats itself. But really, the answer to both questions is that this is a matter of access or intimacy. Access or intimacy and or intimacy. You see, access or intimacy breeds, breed, breeds revelation you can't know what is behind the veil unless you are granted access behind the veil so then we began we begin to understand when we say that the father says tell my people to return to me we begin to understand why. Because in returning, he is giving us the opportunity for access, which in turn breeds revelation. You know, the Bible actually says that no man can receive what he has not first received of heaven. If heaven is of the Father and the Father is of heaven, then that statement must mean no one can receive except God has first given it to him. 
So how do you receive of something which is with or of God except that you have access somehow, except that you have a way of knowing? So the Bible says in First Corinthians chapter 2, for example, there about verse 12, that we have been given the Holy Spirit that we might know. That we might know. And the import of that statement is revealed in Ephesians chapter 2, about verse 18 or 19. It actually says that we have, we have access to God by the same Spirit. That is both Jew and Gentile. We both have access to God by the Holy Spirit. And we have been given the Holy Spirit that we may know. Because through him, we have access to the Father. So through the Holy Spirit, we can know what is behind the veil. We can know that which others cannot possibly know. You see, so, so when Jesus said, that he was going to the Father and that it would advantage us for him to go. We understand now that part of the reason is so that he can send the Holy Spirit. Why did he need to send the Holy Spirit? Because he understood about the function of revelation in particular with the Holy Spirit. He knew that we could not hope to operate at the level or dimension of Christ without the agency of the Holy Spirit. He knew that. Because if Jesus said, I can of my own self do nothing, but as I hear, I judge. If Jesus said that, how do you think that in Christ you can function without similarly being able to hear? How do you do the will of somebody that you don't know? How do you do something you know nothing about? How do you do the will of God without first knowing the will of God? But to know the will of God, you've got to have access. So in telling us, tell my people to return to me, God is inviting us to return to his side. In or by the access which we already have through Christ Jesus. Return to me, he says. Now, I said at the beginning that this is going to center around the bride of Christ. So imagine Christ asking his bride to return to him. And therefore, in returning, what the possibilities can be in the matter of access and therefore revelation. You cannot know certain things unless you have access. Being the bride of Christ, the church was designed to have the kind of access that a bride is supposed to have with respect to her groom. Now, several characters in the Bible had similar access. Some used it to honor, some used it to dishonor. I'll give a couple of examples on both sides. On the side of dishonor, of course, we just mentioned Herodias. How did she know that the king would respond like that and therefore to tell her daughter when the king asks you to speak your mind, ask for the head of John the Baptist. How did she know that that was going to happen? She had access to the king. She understood about the man because she had access. She had access. You know, the Bible says, who can know the mind of a man save his spirit that is within him? 
Please don't say that in front of his wife. You understand what I'm saying? Because by the very fact of access and therefore intimacy, just by watching him day in, day out, watching his body language, listening to what he's saying, somebody with access can piece certain things together and arrive at a reasonable conclusion because of access. And as we see, Herodias was right. Just that she used it to destroy John the Baptist. But then the second one, and perhaps more popular than Herodias, is Jezebel, 1 Kings chapter 21. Jezebel, the wife of King Ahab. She too had similar access. In fact, today, we understand the popular Jezebel spirit, and it is named after her because of this matter. That is to say, the Jezebel spirit necessarily has access. That is the primary thing about that spirit, access to authority. Access to authority. To usurp it, to turn it in the direction away from Christ in particular. And the third example will be the one in Acts chapter 13 about the sorcerer called Bar Jesus. The Bible says that he attached himself to the deputy of the county. And when the deputy sent for the apostles because he wanted to hear the gospel, the Bible says that this sorcerer withstood the preachers seeking to turn the deputy away from the faith. Away from the faith. This was not a wife figure or a, a, a bride figure. But because of the same access, he had attached himself to the deputy of the county. So he had access. Now, many of us have had that kind of access. I, too, have had that kind of access. And without realizing some of the things that we'll be sharing today, we have abused that access. We have used it ingloriously. So Jezebel, Herodias, and then the sorcerer in Acts chapter 13. Those are ready examples of people who had access but misused it. But then there is the other group who used their access for honorable things. Of course, the first one will have to be Esther. Because she had access, she was able to save her people from oppression. She was able to go to the king because she had access. Can I go to the king as I'm sitting down here? Can I go to the king? It would take some doing to get even nearby or, or near, close by. By king, I mean the president of my country. The second example is found in First, first Kings chapter 5, and it starts to read from verse, the very, very first verse. First Kings chapter 1 from verse 5, actually. Now this speaks about Solomon's mother, Bathsheba, who was King David's wife, as we of course know. Now the story goes that Adonijah had usurped the throne. He had declared himself king. And he had significant men in the country on his side. Some priests, some prophets, some military leaders. He had declared himself publicly to be king. The throne was his. So he thought. But the Bible says that the prophet Nathan spoke with the mother of Solomon and said to her, go into the bed chamber 
and start to discuss this matter with the king. And I'll come in and attest to what you are saying, that the throne had been promised her son, Solomon. How on earth could that have happened if Bathsheba did not have access to the king? Adonijah did not have access to his father. But his father's wife, Bathsheba, had access. So she used her access properly and regained the throne for her son. Notice, I say notice. You can use this wherever or however you wish. Solomon was declared king in the bedchamber. Adonijah declared himself king in public. At the end of the day, who reigned as king? The one that was declared in the bedchamber. You know, there is some bedchamber business that we need to understand. It's a question of access. It's a question of access. In some cases, it may be the bedchamber. In other cases, it may be the throne room. Sometimes it may not be bedchamber, it may not be throne room. It may just be the place where certain significant people are gathered. So I often say to people, or I often ask people, who is speaking for you? in the place where it matters most. Whether it be in the throne room of God, where Jesus continually makes intercession for us, or whether it be in the palace of a king, who is speaking for you? Who or what? So that's, that's number two. Bathsheba had access, and she delivered the kingdom into the, son, into the son's hands. Now the third one would be Jesus himself, of course. Notice that if Jesus did not have access to the Father, he would not have been able to present his blood to the Father. The blood of our redemption, that is. We are saved today because Jesus had access. And Jesus was the Son. Not even the bride. And the Bible says now that in him we have access. It says, for example, in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, that being freely justified by his grace, we have access by him unto this grace. Now, number four, of course, would be Elijah. Elijah had access. Elijah the prophet had access. And he said, 1 Kings 17, 1 and 2, there shall be no rain in Israel, Sorry, he said, as long as the Lord God lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither rain nor dew in Israel until I say so. The critical thing there is not any other thing that he said, but before whom I stand. Before whom I stand means he had access. He had access. Now remember, we're talking about the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. Who are these his my people? But the bride of Christ. So it is the bride which we are that is being called to where we belong. In his presence, in the bedchamber, in the secret place. He says, tell my people to return to my place. Why? Why do we need to return? Access breeds revelation. Now, in this place of access, we have something akin to the run of the place. We have access. We have access. Satan had access. Well, Lucifer had access. And he wanted to take over the place. Because we have access, all the advantages and trappings of being in the palace, the place of privilege, become open to us as a result. Now hear me out on this and then I'll close. As a result of having access, especially when we agree to return, as a result of having access, we can hear and know 
things. We can hear and know things. Why? You are there. You have access. And with the information that we get because of our access, we can influence outcomes. How do you know what to do when you don't have information about what gives? We can influence outcomes much the same way we refer to as intercession. If you don't know that it has been decreed that somebody be killed or be harmed some way, how are you going to plead his case when you don't even know? What you are going to see is that they just carried out the action. Too late. But if you have the information beforehand, now you can plead. You know, because we have access, we can know what is trending in the palace. You can know when something is brewing because you have access. Those generally in the palace have a rough idea when the king wakes up because the ambience in the palace changes. Because we have access, we can know the heartbeat of the king. We can know who or what he wants. And this is how Rebecca knew what Isaac wanted. And she used it to the advantage of the son that she loved, her favorite son, Jacob. Because she knew she had access. So she knew. Because we have access, we can know the comings and the goings of the palace. When you start seeing certain people coming into the palace to see the king uh, at an odd hour, you know something is up. That will make you put your ear to the ground so you can find out what is going on. But if you are far away, how are you going to know? And then how are you going to advantage yourself? Because we have access, we can know who is in favor and who is out of favor. And so there's no point aligning yourself with somebody who is out of favor. That's a waste of time. And if we can know the mood of the palace, then we can know the mood of the king. So can you begin to imagine what God is inviting us to when he says, tell my people to return to me? He's inviting us not just to intimacy, is inviting us to the advantages of access. You know, with the kind of access we are talking about and therefore the information that is possible, we can be positioned to do two critical things. Use the information to our advantage or use it to the glory of God, depending on what the situation is. But first, the Father says to the church, the bride of Christ, to return to him. Without this, we are actually lame, unable to advantage ourselves. Jesus said, as I hear, I judge. How could he hear without access? How could he do the will of of God without first knowing that will through access to the throne room. Jesus said, and if we are necessarily one with Jesus, we too should be able to say, as I hear, I judge. The issue now is, how do you hear without access? So the Father says, tell my people to return to me so that we can be advantaged with the access. Beloved, we are the bride of Christ. The bride. We own the bed chamber. We have right of way. We have access. We are his bride. We are called to his side in oneness. We are supposed to have information that will benefit us and that we can use to benefit others. Jesus said, as I hear, I judge. How do you hear? What are you hearing? What informs the decisions which you make? 
perhaps now we begin to understand why we are the way we are. If you are operating by hearing from the world, then you are necessarily going to be like the world. But my time is up. And we must do this again tomorrow. Same time. And until then, the Father says, come to my side. There are things I want to tell you. There are things I want to expose you to. There are things I want to advantage you by. God bless you.